I had a bad experience early in my ministry. I was talking to someone about my work, and I explained that although I get paid by my church and I'm accountable to them, and I'm also accountable to the bishop, I actually work for God. The person I was talking to said, you work for God? That's what serial killers say. And my feelings were hurt. Later, I realized, though, it did sound kind of arrogant to say I work for God without including the fact that I think all committed Christians work for God, not just the pastor. Also, maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that what we say about our faith sounds crazy, especially the claims that we make this time of the year. It isn't shocking that the world has its doubts about Christians. Part of the problem is something we can't do anything about. We believe Jesus died and God raised him from the dead. It's hard to get your mind around that. But we know in our hearts that Christ is risen. Another reason people have doubts about Christians and church is that we don't act the way Jesus acted. Oftentimes we don't behave as if we actually believe in Jesus. We can be judgmental, hypocritical, stubborn, and self-centered. It makes people doubt our sincerity, and worse yet, it makes people afraid of us. Sometimes when I go to a party, I don't want to tell people what I do for a living. I don't want to spoil their fun. I can be having a nice conversation with someone, and we can be having a great time. And that ends when I tell them I'm a pastor. They get nervous. They try to remember if they said any bad words while we were talking. They have their doubts about Christians. And they think I'll judge them if they they say a curse word or drink a beer. I know other pastors sometimes feel that way too. One I know used to say he did social work. Someone sent me a video of a pastor trying to explain his job without saying he was a pastor. A woman on a plane asked him what he did, and he said he worked for a global enterprise. We have outlets in almost every country in the world. We have hospitals and hospices, homeless shelters and feeding programs. We educate, we do marriage work and grief counseling. Basically, we take care of people from birth to death. And she said, wow, what's it called? And he said, the church. We know all the great things the church does. I see all the loving things individual Christians do every week that that are never going to make the news. I understand why the world has its doubts about the church. We brought it on ourselves with things like the Crusades, the Inquisition, our acceptance of segregation and our mistreatment of the LGBTQ community. People doubt us because of all the times the church has acted out of fear and judgment instead of love. Our gospel lesson today shows the early church huddled behind a locked door. This was not the church at its best. The disciples were afraid. Jesus had been killed and not just killed, tortured and killed. They were afraid they were next. They didn't expect to see the Lord again, even though he told them he would be resurrected. While they were hiding and afraid and expecting the worst, Jesus came to them. He breathed the Holy Spirit on them and he showed them his hands and his feet and they were changed. They weren't afraid anymore. Thomas was not there that day. He did not believe his friends when they said, we have seen the Lord. That's how he got his nickname, Doubting Thomas. I have always said that this is unfair. The other disciples doubted too. Jesus told them he was coming back, and they didn't believe. They didn't believe until they saw him. Thomas needed exactly what they needed. He doesn't seem like any more of a doubter to me than any of the rest of them. Also, I remember Thomas more for his bravery and his straightforwardness. He didn't sugarcoat things and he didn't run away. He wasn't huddled behind a locked door, scared and afraid that day. I bet he was out getting on with his life. 
Do you remember when Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead and everyone was worried? They were worried he was going to be killed. It was Thomas who said, okay, let's go with him and die with him. Why do we remember him as Thomas the doubter and not Thomas the brave? Everyone has doubts sometimes. Do you remember when Jesus said to his disciples, you know the way to the place where I'm going? And Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Why don't we remember him as Thomas the honest instead of Thomas the doubter? Let's not be too hard on Thomas. We have doubts too. He didn't believe until Jesus came to him. We're no different. We can't believe on our own. The Holy Spirit comes to us and we feel Christ in our hearts. Even Christians who have strong faith go through a dark night of the soul now and then. We sometimes have dry spells in our life of faith. We need to be renewed. Thomas asked for what he needed and he got it. We can do that too. I have shared with my congregation that I had a very hard time in confirmation class. I was learning about the Trinity and about the commandments and about the resurrection. I was afraid. I was afraid that I was not going to be able to believe. And I was ashamed. I assumed that none of the adults in my life had ever doubted. I had a teacher who helped me. I don't remember his name, but I remember his kindness. He didn't judge or scold. He noticed that something was wrong, and he went out of his way to convince me that my doubts were normal and that I would be okay. I wish I could tell you that I got better overnight. The truth is that I was tormented. I was already an anxious teen, and this just put me over the top. Sometimes I couldn't even sleep at night. But I read my Bible. I read the Bible, and one day I came to the story of Thomas, the story of the disciple who didn't believe what he was told and only believed after Jesus came to him and said, okay, Thomas, here are my wounds, touch them and believe. I read the story over and over. I finally stopped on the part that said, blessed are those who have not yet seen and have come to believe. And I thought, that's me. He's talking to me. He's talking about us. We are the blessed who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I was okay after that because like Thomas, Jesus had come to me and given me what I needed. It is understandable that the world doesn't completely trust Christians. It doesn't matter if they have doubts about us or doubts about the church. We have plenty of doubts of our own, doubts about ourselves. It isn't about us or about what anyone thinks of us. It's about Jesus. It's about who he is and what he does. He ate with sinners and outcasts. He gave up his life to redeem ours. He didn't judge Thomas or the other disciples when they had doubts. He came to Thomas because Thomas needed him to. He continues to meet us where we are. When Thomas saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. We can say it too. We doubt and we are doubted. But because of who Jesus is and what he did, we can join Thomas in saying, my Lord and my God. Did you ever see the movie, The Blues Brothers? Jake and Elwood are trying to get their old band back together to raise money to save an orphanage. They boldly proclaim that they can't fail because they are on a mission from God. It's funny, but it's sweet and endearing. They're not embarrassed. They don't care if people doubt them. And I think that's part of why the movie has become a classic. They're not afraid to just put it out there. Like it or not, they are on a mission from God. We shouldn't be afraid to just put it out there either. I am flawed and sinful, and I have my doubts, but I work for God. You work for God, too. You're not the perfect disciple. None of us are. But we have seen the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen 
indeed.